Balloon-Assisted Stratosphere Experiments. Hi, I'm Andres Adams. These are my partners in crime, Ethan Brower and John Stroman. Uh, we go to DePaul University, working with Howard Brooks on the base experiment. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> the base is operated under the physics and astronomy department at DePaul University. Originally, so we launched balloons. You know, that's pretty much what this conference is about. Originally, we used helium-filled balloons, but we're deciding to make the change to switch to a more helium-hydrogen mixture. This is for two reasons. One, um, helium in general is more expensive, and we like to save some more money with that. But more importantly, for the second reason, we would like uh, to lift up larger payloads, heavier weights, at about the same altitude with about the same amount of air, and hydrogen can do that. So that'll be a little future for the project right there. Um, in addition, we'd like to thank Stratostar for our equipment. We haven't had as much trouble with uh, our flights, although I've only been with the uh, base since the start of the spring semester. Um, but I have, we haven't had any complications since then. Um, yes, <laughs> no strings broken, so, yeah. So to begin, um, we fly Geiger counters, or before I mention that actually, uh, I'll just talk about some cosmic rays. So we all know that there's cosmic rays coming in to the atmosphere. Subatomic particles coming from outer space, heading towards the Earth, and they hit the atmosphere and interact with it, basically. Um, we have Geiger counters that we fly up, and these are used to record the number of particles detected, and they do so in junction with some stamp boards that we use. We'll talk a little bit more, more about that later. Um, we notice that the number of particles generally that <clears throat> we see related to the density of air molecules and the intensity of the cosmic rays coming in. That's about all I really have to say about cosmic rays. Um, so here's a, here's a Geiger counter open up. Uh, this is the arrangement we fly. We're actually going to pass around if you can. This is uh, one of the pods that we fly. Um, inside, there's. Would you guys like an up close personal view of it? <laughs> Just pass it around, it's yeah. fine. So, um, this summer we flying a triple Geiger counter array. Um, how originally as base started, we were reproducing Bruno Rossi's experiment in which we, instead of just measuring how lead would aff affect the coincidence rate um, of the Geiger counters on the ground, we decided to fly it up in the air. Um, and then later on, as the base progressed, we started to use, and uh, we started to use lead. So we originally we put lead on the ground, and we got similar results to Bruno Rossi. So thought we'd put it up with lead in the air. And originally we thought, well, you know, it would probably still block off some of the coincidence rates as we fly the lead up. But we actually found it to have a different effect. Instead, the uh, coincidence rates were increased as we flew the lead up with the Geiger counters. So we've been investigating it, and currently where we stand, uh, we investigate single, double, and triple coincidence rates, in which double and triple just mean that a uh, cosmic ray will come in, it'll interact with the gas that's inside the Geiger counter, It'll essentially just ionize the gas, 
causing a potential difference, which since it's hooked up to a stamp board, the, a current is created, a uh, signal sent to the stamp board, and it, um, it records it from there. Um, so we've just been looking at how the rate of the coincidence is, is affected by altitude and the presence of lead shielding. So here's just some <clears throat> aspects of Rossi's ground experiment. Um, later on, we'll, or one of my colleagues will talk about how our data relates to his, but yeah. So here's what we used to count. Um, inside the box, we have stamp boards, and they use a 555 one shot circuit. Essentially, in the past, a different circuit was used, but we had, there was a problem with double counting, and this just skewed the data. So we switched to the 555 one shot circuit, which enabled us to essentially only get one counting because it has a um, RC time constant that was a lot smaller than previous models used. Um, I don't know the previous models, but I know this one was uh, 0.45 milliseconds. So um, when we, con we conduct two, experiment or two separate situations in which we put lead and no lead on ground, when the Geiger counter is just stationary on the ground, this uh, records in, uh, coincidences every 7.5 minutes over a long run or a period of five days. And then when we launch it, we use a shorter program because we can't keep our balloon up for five days straight. And um, this records coincidences every minute. And uh, to talk more about our findings in particular, have my friend Ethan Brower. Um, so, so far over the spring and summer, we have had three different flights. Um, they're the 56th, 7th, and 58th flight of the base program. And uh, on each flight, we had uh, two different payload boxes that each had their own uh, Geiger counter array. So um, that's the difference between the flights labeled A and B. Uh, it's actually the same flight, but a different box and different set of data. So on the first flight, uh, neither box had any lead. Um, and this is the uh, data just for the single Geiger counters. Um, so you can see that uh, as we go and look through at the other data from uh, flights with arrays that did have the lead shielding, the overall counts were not affected um, too much in terms of where they peaked. but. Uh, the uh, coincidences were. So uh, we measure coincidences in different sets uh, or different types. Like Andres mentioned, we have the triple coincidence. Um, and because the Geiger counters are, uh, the array is in a triangular formation, it's set up so that no single particle can go through all three Geiger counters at once. Um, and so we use the triple coincidences to indicate when there's a shower event, which is um, a particle that is sufficiently energetic hitting uh, either the lead or uh, um, just an air molecule and then uh, decaying or, or splitting into multiple less energetic particles. And so that's um, when you have multiple particles uh, generally present in uh, at the same time. So that's how you get the triple coincidence. Um, this graph, however, is between the vertical double coincidences and of the horizontal double coincidences. So that's just um, going through the two uh, Geiger counters that are horizontal or uh, two of them that are vertical uh, in our array. So uh, some of the important features of uh, these graphs are that uh, at lower altitudes, the horizontal coincidences are significantly uh, less common or frequent than the vertical coincidences. Uh, but at a uh, higher altitude, the horizontal coincidences actually become more, uh, more common, occur more frequently. Um, so we believe that this is going on simply because at sea level, or ground level rather, for in Indiana, um, the 
uh, particles that would be coming uh, to go through uh, the horizontal um, uh, the horizontal Geiger counters uh, would have to come so far through the atmosphere that um, either they simply decay because of the time that it would take them to reach there, or because uh, they have to go further through the atmosphere, they're more likely to interact with uh, air molecules in the atmosphere. Um, but then when you reach the higher altitudes, um, the, that distance that they would have to come horizontally through the atmosphere doesn't become so much of an issue. Uh, and in fact, because of the greater density of air molecules, or rather, uh, the greater number of air molecules that they'd have to go by the uh, increased probability of interacting with those uh, actually uh, increases the number of uh, horizontal coincidences that we see. And then this is uh, the triple coincidences. So as you can see, there's not a lot, uh, at least without lead. Um, they peak at three, and that's at about the highest altitude. Um, so this is the same flight with the other payload box. Um, so again, this is just the single uh, Geiger counter data, and it has pretty much the same curve and uh, pretty much the same peak counts. And uh, again, you see the same phenomenon going on in the double coincidences where the horizontal coincidences uh, become more frequent at higher altitude. And again, for the triple coincidences, uh, not very frequent um, without the lead, even at the higher altitude, peaking around two. So on the next flight, we uh, did one box that had one centimeter of lead shielding above the Geiger counters. Um, and the other box, we flew with no lead. Uh, this is to uh, basically look at how the uh, the lead shielding affects the uh, presence of coincidences because of sufficiently energetic particles creating a shower event in the lead. So Andres talked a little bit about uh, the historical experiment uh, that has frequently been uh, conducted on the ground. Um, so this is, uh, again, it in the air, but we're looking at uh, how uh, the, the count same thing, how the counts are affected by the presence of lead. Um, and at the, uh, the peak region of counting, you can see that the single counters aren't affected uh, terribly much by the presence of lead, but that the coincidences are, um, particularly the triple coincidences, you can see that uh, with no lead, we are having maximum uh, counting minutes of two or three coincidences. Here we actually have one instance with 11, and uh, the minutes with two and three coincidences are very frequent, and uh, as well as four or five, et cetera. Um, so again, this was the other box on the same flight which had no lead. And again, you're seeing basically the same thing as the other flights with no lead, except that um, the double coincidences, uh, particularly the horizontals, are much higher than before. I'll talk about that again a little in a minute, but uh, we think that's just an error in our counting mechanism. Uh, something with the wiring has gone askew, so we need to debug that. Um, and again, we think that whatever that error was that caused us to see the more or more frequent uh, double coincidences, we believe is also probably responsible for uh, the high rate of triple coincidences here, uh, simply because uh, otherwise, these values would be very uncharacteristic of uh, what we've been seeing with other, uh, other times of counting with no lead. Um, so then we flew it uh, a flight with a quarter centimeter of lead. And um, again, for the single or excuse me, the single counts, uh, the value is not terribly uh, affected by the presence of lead. But then the coincidences are, um, particularly the triple coincidences, uh, not as much as when there's one centimeter, but again, uh, they're significantly more frequent, frequent than when we had no lead on top of them. And so then this is the other um, single counting without lead from the other box on the same flight. And again, we're seeing very high double coincidences 
and triple coincidences, which we believe is still uh, a wiring issue. And so here's it all just in uh, a table to be summarized. Um, so uh, we obviously need to collect a lot more data, but uh, thus far um, uh, we seem to have a, a, a decent correlation between uh, the ground data and uh, what we're seeing happening during the flight. Um, uh, again, you can see that uh, the uh, the ones that are starred there with the higher coincidence rates are um, uh, their orders of magnitude greater than what we've been seeing before, and they uh, these are the only two uh, counting periods in which this has happened. So uh, we're reasonably sure that that's just uh, an error in our data. So John's going to talk a little bit about the ground data now. Well, this is just a. Uh little table of some of the, of the ground data we've seen so far. And uh, normally, with the ground data, we're one that, uh, we run this same array, essentially. There's the two boxes we set up on the table, and we run the same kind of, uh, same program and everything, just we use uh, five-day increments instead of, you know, an hour and a half of what, like a flight would. And they use, uh, instead of a, every minute it measures, it measures every uh, seven and a half minutes. And so far, we don't have a ton of ground data. We have about, uh, between five, we run it in the five day increments. Most of them have 10 days. Uh, one is five days, one is 15 days. So one of the things we'll have to do is uh, obviously keep running ground tests. This is kind of, uh, if you remember the curve from the beginning when it kind of, uh, we're expecting uh, the maximum amount of coincidence is going to occur, occur around uh, one centimeter of, one to two centimeters of lead. Uh, you can kind of see the trend is starting to appear there. We're going to have to run some more on this. but. Uh, this, this is pretty much, this is essentially the uh, showering and shielding effects of various lead thicknesses. And uh, up to one centimeter, uh, it shows increasing coincidences due to uh, the increased showering effect. As, as the lead thickness increases, the coincidence increase. And then in the two to three centimeter thicknesses, you can see that the coincidence have decreased, and that's uh, because of the increased uh, shielding effects. Because at, after a certain point, the, uh, the lead stops increasing the counts and starts decreasing it because more of the particles are absorbed instead of causing a shower. And uh, Rossi's data showed that the, the maximum was around one to two, and that's what we're kind of expecting to see if that, uh, how that holds true in the ground and up in the air. And then uh, some conclusions from uh, the research we had so far. Uh, we found that, as expected, horizontal, vertical, and triple coincidences all occur at much higher rates in the upper atmosphere than the ground level, which, obviously. and. Uh, in our data, horizontal coincidences occur at a much lower rate than vertical coincidences at ground level. Ethan talked about that a little bit. And then at high altitudes, the horizontal coincidences occur at a higher rate than vertical coincidences. And uh, so far, our ground data is fairly consistent with that of, uh, yeah, there we go. It's fairly consistent with that of uh, the early work by Rossi and other scientists, and our flight data shows a similar pattern of lead shielding and showering as the ground data, but more flights are needed to determine the critical shielding in the upper atmosphere. And uh, some of our future work, most obvious thing is we need more flights. We have, uh, we've run three flights uh, this spring and summer, some of the weather and was not cooperating. And we have uh, nine more planned for the summer, including multiple flights uh, with, you know, half a centimeter, two centimeter, and we're even trying to try four centimeters of lead to expand the, our breadth of data. Because yeah, uh, uh, this, this current form of the project has only been working since February, so we haven't had super ton of time because weather is obviously not so great in Indiana in February. And uh, one of the things we're going to look for is especially to uh, increase our data in the horizontal and vertical coincidences because that's completely new for us just recently. Anything else you guys can think of? <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you for listening and does anybody have any questions?